the studio. I'm Kim hicks Die. Chances are you've heard of the Department of Social Services, but you may be surprised about their role right here in our community. Now joining me right now is Therese Wolf, who is the Director of the Department of Social Services, uh -huh. and also Pastor John Lewis, who is the Outreach and Chaplaincy Coordinator. Welcome to In the Studio. Thank you. Thank you. For having us. Mm -hmm. It's great to be here. I want to first start with you as the Director. Tell us about the role of your agency. Okay. So um, social services, is, we are one of 24 social service departments in the state. We are, you not so much because you work a little bit differently, but we are all state employees. This is a state agency. And I kind of remind people of that because sometimes folks forget um, that we are part of a, an umbrella in the state, um, but we live in, and work in Charles County. So the services that we provide are all to Charles County citizens. Those services are far um, above and beyond what most people think that we do. Um, often people know us as the agency where you can come to get food stamps. Mm -hmm. We are the agency that does child protective service investigations. We are also an agency where people can come if they're having some issues with Medicaid and obtaining Medicaid coverage. But we do so much more. We serve over 22,000 distinct individuals in this county every year. We do everything from um, license foster homes and place children in foster care when we unfortunately need to remove them from their homes to uh, we, we are the place that you can come to apply for food stamps. We provide emergency assistance to families and children in the community. Um, we also are the agency that manages child support cases. Mm -hmm. As part of that whole program, we have a fatherhood program where we work with men who are um, struggling to obtain jobs so that they can support their children. And that program has been very successful, hasn't it? It has uh -huh. been. It has mm -hmm. been around, mm, boy, it's, it's been around at least for eight to 10 years at least. Mm -hmm. um, I think it maybe even before that a little bit. But it has been a very successful program, both in terms of helping people get jobs as well as, if you will, reuniting fathers with their children and helping them develop that, that father-child relationship that many of them did not have. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, yes, mothers uh, obviously play that's a true. prime role, but fathers too, the involvement of the father means a lot. Yeah, it's a very important role. And, and the piece that most people don't know about our fatherhood program is that while it grew out of this whole child support issue, mm -hmm. it is a, it's a program available to almost any father who feels the need or desire to learn more about being a parent. Um, it, you don't have to be involved in child support. You simply have to be a resident of this county who, for whatever reason, would like the support of our staff and other other fathers in terms of understanding the role of being a father with mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. It's free. It's available to any man in the county. Um, our, some of the, the, the fathers that are involved in our foster care program are, have been involved in that program as well. I think... Um, what people don't always know about social services is that while while we have a, a, a somewhat narrow scope of work that we do in the county, we actually go beyond that a lot, meaning that what's real important to us is to be connected to our partner agencies, to be working with the sheriff's department and the schools and um, uh, the health department, the center for children, our food pantries. We work across all those partners to bring services to the people in this county. And one of the, the, the goals, if you will, of our county, uh, of the agency in the next year is to really be working out in the community, not so much in our offices at 200 Kent Street, but to be out in the community providing our services to people where they live mm -hmm. um, and to work with our partner agencies around addressing some of the, the higher needs of this county. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about partnerships, again, uh, Pastor Lewis, as outreach and chaplaincy mm -hmm. coordinator, I think that's a good segue. Yeah. Please and explain And that's where this, he huh? came mm -hmm. from. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So, well, part of what we, we want to do is reach the faith community. So, um, and when we talk about reaching the faith community, we're not just talking about 
Christ, Christians, mm -hmm. we're talking about the broad scope. We want to interact with our Muslim brothers and sisters. We want to interact with the Jewish sect. We want to be involved with those who are and maybe involved in some type of uh, uh, denomination that we're not very familiar with, but they want to assist the people in this county. So a part of my job is to mesh with anyone who says that we want to be a part of this community effort. So we'll be scheduling uh, a faith leaders gathering so that people can understand how the Department of Social Services can actually help their church or their ministries. Uh, many of us in ministry, we get people that come to us at least once a week that need a place to stay. They uh -huh. need food. They need this. They need that. And as a church, sometimes we feel like we have to do it all. Mm -hmm. um, but, but God has given us an agency like the Department of Social Services. One thing that uh, Teresa has been really um, pressing upon us is to, to, to just kind of to blend with the community. She hasn't mentioned it, but DSS has just started its uh, emergency food pantry. In fact, we have a huge donation that we're picking up today mm -hmm. from the hospital. I mean, a huge donation. Mm -hmm. Spring Hill Center is involved in that. The uh, school system, they gave us a huge donation. Rotary Club came along. And, you know, and these were just people that the drop of a hat, you know, no, with no pressure at all, just calling them and saying, hey, listen, you know, the Department of Social Services wants to do more. Um, I think that this idea of bringing, uh, and I, I would say this even if it wasn't me, okay? <laughs> okay. But just bringing someone in that says, hey, I have a heart for the total community because it's not just the faith community that we're going to be working with. We're still going to work yeah. with those other partnering agencies. We're still going to work with those volunteers. We're still going to work with those people who say, hey, I don't even want anything to do with faith organizations. Mm -hmm. But okay. guess what? I want to help people in this county. Mm -hmm. Good point, because I was going to ask you that. Because mm -hmm. this is a real partnership. For, you know, and like you said, there might be some people that say, oh, I'm not into that. But... You may show them a few things, no, right? Well, about I mean, think about it like this. We uh, we went out when we got ready to, to pull a food pantry together, mm -hmm. and, and it's a team effort. We went to the Jude House. Individuals that were that were dealing with some mind-altering uh, substances uh, uh, issues and said, hey, do you all have volunteers that want to help us get the room together? Boom, they mm -hmm. sent down people. Mm -hmm. They just sent down people. So it's so many people that want to help but maybe don't know how, and that's a part of the strategy that yeah, Teresa's putting is. together. People, we, we're going to be letting people know. We have a few things that are, they're not, haven't materialized just yet, but we have a few things where we're talking about uh, a number of, well, a series of gatherings where people can come and just hear about what we do. And mm -hmm. we've been talking about that mm -hmm. for the longest, and I believe we're going to have that done. I won't try to put the time on it because you're live. <laughs> but I will say this, <laughs> but I will say this, that's a part of the plan to let people know what the agency is doing and how it will assist other agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keyword is assist because sometimes people do kind of get into silos of this is like my 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 kernel and, and stuff. And you really want to reassure people that um, it's it's a pie and everybody can have a slice, right? <laughs> yes. Is that Absolutely. a good way of putting it? You know, and I, and I think of things like, you know, so we are the only agency, for example, that can provide temporary cash assistance in, in a certain way and the only agency that can do food stamps. We're the only agency in the county that by law can, um, can have foster and license foster families, for example, and place children in foster care. But we are not the agency that can educate you know, students. We're not the agency that can manage um, the homeless population and provide them with um, housing, if you will, at nighttime, the way Lifestyles has. Um, we're not Jude House. You know, we, we don't provide that level of service to people who are, are struggling with substance abuse. So um, the, the vision is that, that we reach out to people to support us in the things that we can do 
and but that we're reaching out to these other agencies in the area to say how can we support you mm -hmm. how can we bring what we offer this community and add it to what you do so mm -hmm. um, again I think and, and we don't have a time frame but but you have a good point mm -hmm. one of the things we are planning right now is how we can set a schedule where one or two days a month um, my staff at the agency are providing um, services at places in Nanjamoy or Indian Head or um, God, I can't, can't even think of other areas mm -hmm. of the county, but places but around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So rather than people always having to come to our doors, we're going out there to make services available so that they don't have to travel. That's going to require us to reach out to the faith community, to communities to say, do you have space for us? Can we come in? So it, it is, everyone has a piece of the pie. Um, how do we bring our services together to best serve? This community's gotten large enough now that I have um, I have the ability to take what we do out to where the people are um, who need this, and bringing people like John in is also a way for us to start educating more and more mm -hmm. uh, the community about what we do and how can we you know again how do we support you how can we help. Um, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. There was one so. thing uh, I wanted to touch on too that uh, people may not be aware of. I know you've talked about your role um, with children and mm -hmm. what you think of, but also senior citizens too. Tell us about those services as well. So we have an adult services program. Um, it complements some of what is done at the Department of Community Services, which people often get us mistaken for each other. Mm -hmm. um, we are one, one agency that does provide two particular types of services. One is adult protective services. So uh, if there are situations in the county, if, if somebody in the county is concerned that an elderly um, family member or friend is somehow either being abused or exploited or neglected, you know, unfortunately one of the things we do see at times are older people who are struggling with dementia or whatever and and they have some money mm -hmm. and that money sometimes is being exploited or that money is being taken by people in their lives. Um, we provide adult protective investigations in those types of situations to try to uh, assess whether or not this older person is in need of additional help to protect their money, to protect their health. Um, so there's adult protective services. We do those investigations. We may then provide follow-up services. We also provide services to a wider range of adults who are unable to live on their own but can live in a supported environment, not meaning a nursing home or assisted living, mm -hmm. but could live in a family if there were a family available to work with them. So we have a program called um, Project Care, mm -hmm. and Project Care is adult foster care. We have, and I'm terrible at this because I won't remember how many families, but I want to say we have about 10 families in the area who provide provide 24-hour-a-day, um, seven-day care for adults who, again, need that level of, they need someone to be there with them during the day to mm -hmm. kind of monitor them and work with them, but these are adults who can still live in a family. We do other in-home services. Um, there are probably about 60 different people that we provide daily support with our um, certified nursing assistants who go into their homes. They qualify for these services. There are eligibility requirements, but we, um, my CNAs go into their home, provide whatever care that they need. They help to train the family members how to take care of them. So you're, you're right, that's a, mm -hmm. a, a program that's always kind of under the radar but it, it services a lot of our older citizens in this county. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a great program. Yeah. So and I was just kind of looking to see what's Therese right. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little PowerPoint here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, Therese, the, at some point, will we get a chance to talk about trauma-informed communities? Because I just, um, I, I think that's uh -huh. going to be something that's going to be big for this county that Department of Social Services is gonna to bring to the citizens here, so. Um, Tell us more, um, what mm -hmm. is this? I'm gonna get her started. Okay, you know, all right. <laughs> so, oh, one of the things that, that we know, and by we I'm talking about just the, the larger pro provider community, and, and that's, that's everybody, that's our partners. It's the, 
it's the schools, it's the sheriff's department, it is the center for children, it's lifestyles, it's all of the different, and I've left so many out, but it's all the different people in this county who are working with clients and customers, is that for people who are really struggling with substance abuse, with child abuse, um, with criminality, Nobody wakes up every day and says, you know what, hey, I want to be a prostitute, or they don't wake up saying I want to be a drug abuser. Things happen in people's lives that, that, um, that inflict trauma, um, that, that that kind of ongoing difficulties that many of our, peop our, our citizens experience, again, whether it's you know, through constant drug abuse, through criminal involvement, whatever, what you discover is that that's often a response to trauma in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, as we move forward, one of the things we recognize is that the best way we can provide service to people in this community is to understand that trauma is an underlying issue for all these folks who are struggling to survive. And that um, while we need, while we need foster care and we need jails and we need substance abuse treatment centers and we need all the things that we have what underlies all that and ties it together is understanding that people are suffering through these situations because of things that have gone on in their lives so how we interact with them and how we provide all those services needs to be done through a lens of understanding trauma mm -hmm. um, and that's when john talks about a trauma-informed community that's that's a, a pretty lofty goal that we have, but I'm watching our partner agencies working hard to learn about trauma, to learn about how to bring that, that concept of trauma into the work they do every day. And that's led to um, an idea, I guess, at our agency about how do we bring in resources to, to provide the training that this whole county could benefit from to understand how to respond to people from that trauma perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Um, something as simple as, as coming into my agency's lobby. When you come into my lobby, the walls are kind of pale green. The floor is like, you know, a tile floor. There's these little metal chairs that you sit in. There's all these posters all over the wall about you are not allowed to do this and you can't do that. And, and they're very rigid and they're very unwelcoming. Mm -hmm. For people who struggle, for people who have trauma that continues to be happening in their lives, walking into a place like that is not welcoming. It doesn't make you feel safe. It doesn't make you feel like we want you there. So we're talking a lot right now just about how do we rethink our lobby? How do we get rid of these pictures on the wall that are or these posters that are not welcoming? Why don't we let people drink water when they're sitting in our lobby? You can't, you can't drink water, you can't use your cell phone. All those things are part of thinking about how do we better respond to people in our community so that they want to be here, so they, they, they know they're welcomed, and that we build trust with them. So a trauma-informed community is a community that shares a perspective on People aren't criminals because they just want to be criminals. People are criminals in part because of things that have gone on in their past. How, do, how does that shape how we respond to them? How does that shape how we talk to them? How do we bring one another on board to work with those folks from a perspective, again, that, that recognizes that what's happened in these people's lives have left them raw, have left them unhealed, mm -hmm. and that they're struggling with that every day of their lives? our children who are in foster care. Um, people often think, for example, that you know, if a child's in a home where they're abused or neglected, get them out, put them in foster care, it's better. Mm -hmm. But it's not. I mean, what we've learned over time is that every time you remove a child from their family, you traumatize them. You put them through something that's not normal. You put them through some, something that will have an effect on them for the rest of their lives. Right. And so, trauma-informed communities become those places where we think about before I remove that child, what can I do to keep him in his family where he, that's the place he really does want to be. Mm -hmm. How do I help his family be a better family to him so that he's not traumatized, so that whatever issues this family ha has, that those things are able to heal. So 
A trauma-informed community then is a group, it, it is an entire community, everything from the sheriff's department to the schools to social services to private agencies to parks and recreation to EMS, that where everybody shares a similar training and a similar perspective on how we see people mm -hmm. who come to our places and who in one way or another again are struggling they may be substance abusers they may not show up for services you know again i've referred to criminal people engage in criminal behavior several times but the idea is that we look at our community as a place where people can heal as opposed to um, believing that that people are substance abusers or they're criminals or whatever just because that's what they want mm -hmm. and and um, it's a long-term project um, right now the schools the, the the sheriff's department and the schools have embarked on an effort to bring some trauma training mm -hmm. to those programs we want to build on that through this by bringing in additional training that will take that to the next step um, the it's an interesting perspective, if you don't mind. Yeah, because yeah, it's different. so much of the time we look at the end behavior and say, well, why are they like that? And, yes. you know, what's wrong with them? Not sure. really knowing. If you go back. Yeah. Can you say something? That's right. That, you yes. know, for, That's right. For me and in, in, in my position, I, I, it just translates to, you know, to love, forgiveness, um, uh, something that you don't normally hear in a job description. Um, being able to go beyond the, the the black lines and say, you know, let's just reach out and do more for this person because they may have been through more than the average person. Now, um, uh, some couple of years ago, before I actually started working with the working for the Department of Social Services, I've been working with them for years, mm -hmm. um, and I remember we were at a um, gathering for foster care youth, and we were asking questions. Like, what would you like oh, to do? Yeah. Is that, this is the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. They were like, one young lady, two young ladies maybe said, I'd like to visit a college. She had never visited mm -hmm. a college. Mm -hmm. Got on the phone in a couple of days, CSM said, come on up for a tour. And we got a chance to take That's foster right. care we youth did. on a tour to a college. Mm -hmm. Now, most people would say, Anybody, you know, anybody that wants to go to a college could have gone or right. whatever the case Easy. is. But we don't mm -hmm. know what happened in her life right. that stopped her from being able to connect with this effort. So when Therese started talking about trauma-informed communities, that's a big word for me that just says love. Mm -hmm. It's a word to me. Like, not, not much changes with me. I'm very narrow-minded in the sense that all I want to do is help. No. I find, <laughs> yeah, really, I find yeah. agencies, and I say this to Therese all the time, you, you didn't find me, I found you. Mm -hmm, so she mm -hmm. says, I hired John Lewis. I, I was like, no, I found this agency because I know it does good for our community. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we get to talking about this trauma-informed community, that more people are going to come along because we're going to build a volunteer base at the Department of Social Services like you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Because I know that there are tons of people out there just like me. I was, I was a volunteer with you probably mm -hmm. since you came on, mm -hmm. back when much. Karen was there. Mm -hmm. So... You know, there are other people that want to help this agency, and I, I'm just looking forward to being in this uh, position uh -huh. for as long as they'll, they'll let me and serve. I, I can sure. truly tell that you really love your job, right? <laughs> he does. And, a little bit. And, and, and full disclosure, too, because I don't want to act like we don't know each other. Um, uh, I've known you, you for a number of years and really admired you. Um, your background is in prison ministry. A lot of people know that and stuff. And uh -huh. so, yes, when you talk about really, you know, going in and meeting people where they are um, and growth and development and stuff. So Yeah, mm -hmm. you know what? That was a, That's a really good good statement because it a lot about trauma and and trauma work really is about meeting people where they're at mm -hmm. and, and I I just appreciate your comment too I think it and we all do we all do it at some point looking at people going why are they doing that you know mm -hmm. yeah lock them up though. or do mm -hmm. this or put mm -hmm. that kid in foster care and I, I'm not it's not that people don't need to experience the consequences of their choices and mm -hmm. their actions but how we get to that place, how we look at those folks. You know, you talk about, you know, you, you do it through this lens of love, which is, I think, part of what trauma-informed is about. Um, 
but it truly is looking at people as you know everybody everybody has value and it doesn't matter that the end behavior is all we're seeing you know what's underneath that and how do we tap into that and how do we do that jointly mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the thing about this county that's always been so appealing is there is this huge desire for, to work together people want to collaborate um, you know, we're, there's a, a lot of us, we're all on the same committees, we see each other at all kinds of different functions, and what that says is there's a lot of people here who are working real hard to help this community be the best it can be, and I think things like, again, um, trauma training, having an outreach coordinator to help get the word out that social services is so much more than what people tend to think it is, mm -hmm. is real important. And again, we're not the be all and end all, but we are an agency that has the wherewithal to support other efforts going on in this county, as well as asking the county to support some of what we do, mm -hmm. um, which, and the county does. I mean, that's kind of how we're able to do what we're doing is you know, again, some of it is just that county support. Mm -hmm. so, well, um, speaking of the, you know, the who knew um, that you all, you know, do this, mm -hmm. you recently held a two-day seminar on human trafficking. And yeah. again, not think, well, first of all, even acknowledging that right here in this community, that it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, tell us all about <clears throat> that, how that came about. Well, how did, I'm trying to think where that all started. Start, start um, two, two, two years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a, a, a woman, her name is Dr. Marlene Carson, and um, one of my um, assistant directors knows her. She is from Ohio and has a long history um, as a victim of human trafficking, of sex trafficking, and then as a consultant, speaker um, ar around that subject. And we brought her in a couple of years ago simply because we had the opportunity to do that. She was in for, I, I think, one day or maybe two. I can't remember for sure. But she did some training with my staff, and then we um, had her at John's Church that in the evening where she did a presentation just for anyone in the community that wanted to, to attend. Mm -hmm. Since that time, a couple things have happened. There have been other events in the community around sex trafficking, and, and, and I'm going to back up one moment. Human trafficking is not just sex trafficking. It is also labor trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, our focus has been on sex trafficking, which is, again, it, it's uh, using people for sexual um, for, for sexuality, you know, sexuality, it, it against their will. It is, um, it is in, in essence sexual abuse, and not just of children, but of, of older people as mm -hmm. well. Human trafficking more broadly brings in that whole group of people who are abducted, sold, sold, if you will, into into a slavery for the purposes of labor. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like, you know, I think of old sweatshops where people were right. chained to tables to work all the time. So both of those go on, but our focus has been on the, on the sexual trafficking. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happened, though, since we did that initial training, we've had two young girls in foster care who both were victims of sex, sex trafficking. And it has been an unbelievable journey at my agency to work with these young girls. Um, finding services in the state of Maryland for them has been almost impossible. And, and not just Maryland, it's everywhere, but this is where we live. So finding services, you know, where do we place them? We got these kids in foster care. They're, they're adolescents, got them in foster care, had no place to put them. Um, their foster homes didn't want them. They, they couldn't be in a foster home because they would run away. Um, there were no group homes or residential treatment centers equipped to take these kinds of youth who, again, part of the trauma of being abducted, being sold, if you will, for sexual um, activity, one of the things that happens is you get to a place, they call it sometimes the Stockholm Syndrome, mm -hmm. where, where instead of hating the person that has done this to you, you begin to align with them. Mm -hmm. It's survival. Right. People don't always understand it, but it is a way to survive. So we've got these two teenage girls who are wiser about the, the ways of the world than most of us ever will be, who don't want to be in care, who we can't find anybody to care for them, 
And we have gone through an unbelievable journey of placing them out of state in locked facilities where they could get treatment, working with their, their parents, one of them who was um, out of a, a, a state on the, on the western shore or the western coast, um, to, to just struggling with how do we help these kids? How do we keep our hands on them long enough so that we can be, we, we can work with them to help them get through this process. We learned a lot. We learned that these kids often need a, 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 something of a lock setting. We learned that it is a multi-year process to work with these kinds of victims because the, the, the messages and the craziness of the person who has trafficked them has become so ingrained. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a cult. I mean, trying to work them out of that takes forever. Um, and it is, and they're always just a heartbeat from kind of falling back into that when, when into into the that world of trafficking when they're stressed out, when they're hurt, when something bad happens. So, all of that has been um, an interesting journey, as I said, for the last couple of years. And on the heels of learning that there have been several other events in the county around sex trafficking. Um, we decided to bring Dr. Carson and her team back for two days to do something more intensive and to, at two levels. One was to reach out to providers and to professionals, which is most of what we did during the day. Anybody could have come to the session, but we had a lot of people at that session from all of Southern Maryland, many of who were um, people who worked at other departments of social services. They worked at private agencies. They were private therapists, the police department, schools, all of that. Mm -hmm. The evening then was really for the community. It, we did one evening at John's Church. Another evening we were at um, Life Point. At Life Point in Waldorf, and that was a l little bit different than during the day. The, so we, we brought all this to the community in part because what we realized is that it was only two kids in foster care. But first of all, that's two too many. But we tend to have about 80 kids on average in foster care at any one time. So we had two at the same time that we know of who are victims of sexual traffic, sex trafficking. And that began to speak to a message of these kids and these traffickers are moving through our county. Mm -hmm. they, they land here in different ways, how these girls ended up landing. Neither of them are from Charles County, by the way. These were two girls that were from other areas, but they find their way here for any number of reasons. Um, and part, you know, part of it is that we, we are on that lane between Florida and New York, which is one of the more heavily trafficked um, roads, if you will. Route 95 is mm -hmm. a great trafficking road for for human traffickers. That's what I was going to uh, bring up, the point yeah. of, you know, people tend to say, well, it's, it's a Florida issue or New York issue, nope. you know, not Charles County. And the fact is that the way it we are situated, yes, it is. And you wouldn't have yeah. done, you wouldn't have done the seminar if had it not been, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, the other thing we learned in the prior that helped make this decision was, you know, the sheriff's department has been through training, additional training on, on human trafficking. That's something that Sheriff Barry, um, he, he came to our event too and spoke to the fact that this is an issue that it may not be the biggest issue he's got to deal with, mm -hmm. but it is one of them and it's one he pays attention to. Chief Shinner at the La Plata Police Department has talked about, you know, believing that this is a much more prevalent issue in, in the county than we sometimes know. I mean, it operates underneath everything, so you don't know how prevalent it is. There have been stings in places like White Plains where they have, you know, they have arrested um, people involved in trafficking. And, uh, you know, I, I recognize that some of the, the national news around people who, you know, mm -hmm. celebrities who are involved in this, I get it, it's national news, but it speaks to the fact that it covers the entire, the entire nation and at varying different levels. Um, part of what makes Charles County and, and so all of Southern Maryland really, and so, you know, Prince George's County, all of us so important in this effort to, to, to fight trafficking is 
is Route 95, it is Route 301. These are some major thoroughfares through here that are and can become huge drawing points for people who are involved in trafficking. Um, there's a lot of work being done. I just saw something over the weekend, too, some education for hotel owners. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're really reaching out to these groups that we know can help fight this problem. Mm -hmm. um, hotel owners, truck stop, um, the staff at truck stops, those are the people who are often on the front line of identifying a yeah. problem that may be existing. Who the people and I, are. And I talked mm -hmm. to, talk mm -hmm. to CSM, and they said that when they do their trainings for uh, CDL drivers that they yeah, they help them it. to understand yeah. mm -hmm. you know some of the signs mm -hmm. of uh, uh, sex trafficking. And I was going to bring up something, but I forgot my thought. Well, uh, <laughs> did we want to talk a little bit about uh, the next? Steps oh, I know, I know what it was. Yeah. I know what it was. The um, the day that. They, they put an article in the newspaper about the sex trafficking event. Did you notice on the yes. front page they had arrested a man from oh, Waldorf yeah. that was yeah, involved right. in sex trafficking? Right, yeah. exactly. And that's where you know, the point of you cannot ignore it is it is happening here. You know? and, and we're a county, you know, understanding how this happens and, and it is so critical too because I think Charles County has the highest commute rate of any county in Maryland. Mm. And that means that we have a lot of our younger children, you know, our, our young teenagers in particular, or teenagers, who spend time on their own because, you know, their parents are commuting to and from work. And we can do things to educate our children and our communities about what to watch for so that those kids are protected. Families don't have to give up their jobs and everybody doesn't have to stay home to protect their children, but they do need to know what's happening and what to watch for and how and what to do if there's something happening that concerns you. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of what the training was about, particularly at the churches, was, you know, because we had families with kids there. Mm -hmm. And the message was, what do you need to know to protect? What do you need to know to, to deal with this? If, what do you need to look for? Uh, exactly. So, and, and if you suspect something, say it, it could be your daughter's friend who is being befriended by somebody twice her age and showering her with gifts and, and that sort of thing. What do you do if you kind of, you know, something just doesn't feel right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, you call the police is one good place to start. And th mm -hmm. there was a lot of discussion about that at, the, um, at, at one of the events because um, the message there was to call, there's a national violent sexual exploitation hotline that you can also call. And one of the messages at the event was, if you call there, those folks are going to tell you a lot of next steps you can take, and they will bring in their resources as well. Mm -hmm. um, calling the police sometimes can be, it depends on how, what's happening that evening and how quickly they can investigate and whether or not um, it's a crisis for them to investigate. But the best thing you can do is to call the sheriff's department or the police department. Let them know of your concerns. Um, you can also call the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we would do that kind of an investigation, but we work very closely with the police department, particularly when it comes to matters of children. And so it's not unusual that we go out together when the issue is to look at whether or not a child is being abused or neglected. Mm -hmm. um, but the, people really need to recognize you are better off calling something in even if you have absolutely no clue if what you see is what you think you're seeing. Mm -hmm. let, let professionals come in behind you and evaluate it and investigate it. Don't try to make the decision on your own. Don't try to say, well, no, it can't really be that. I must not be seeing it right. You don't need to do that. It's better to be safe than sorry is mm -hmm. kind of the message. But again, I, you know, call the Charles County Sheriff's Department call the La Plata Police Department, call the Department of Social Services, call the National Child Sexual Exploitation Hotline. All of that stuff is available there to support you. Mm -hmm. um, where Now, the piece I'd, I'd like to kind of give to you, though, too, because we've talked a little bit about how do we follow up from this training, yes, too. next steps. Uh -huh. There's been lots, not a lot, but there's been, there's been a number of events in the county where it's been about awareness. What do you, who... What do you need to know? Who are these people? You know, what are you looking for? But how we go forward from here really is, I think, an important piece because um, 
you know, I think about our sheriff's department and I think about our state's attorney's office and I think they have all kinds, they have all kinds of support. The county every, and the state provide them with funding, whatever, but they can always use more. Mm -hmm. um, we have good prosecutors here. We have good investigators. How do we make sure they have all the resources that they need? And so, you know, one of the things I'm hoping is that we'll do some follow-up with Sheriff Barry, with the state's attorney's office, um, and actually other providers and other, other partners who are interested in keeping the awareness of this high. But one of the things that we're doing two things beyond that, or to set up for that, one is we're looking at all of the materials we got from our recent event. Um, people did complete evaluation forms, but those evaluation forms included what do you want to see as next steps? What do you think we need to do next? And I know, for example, there were people one night who talked about how do we get training for EMS workers to know what to look for. So that was one of the things that really stuck out for me. Um, so part of it is we're looking at the feedback we got. We're meeting, I think, next week. I'm not sure if, if it's mm -hmm. next week or the week after. Mm -hmm. But there's Some a group of us the, the, who are the in the very the mm -hmm. near future here, mm -hmm. yeah, to look at all that feedback to see how do we shape that into next steps. And we, but, have, some letters. Mm -hmm. we have some letters from some of the youth that attended the, um, the community events. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it will be good, a good time to, to look at what they actually learn. You know, because a lot of us parents were there. We got one thing, but then there were children that were there. We wanted to know what did they take away. So we have a couple of uh, we have five letters from uh, uh, five little, yeah, I'll call them letters from mm -hmm. uh, oh, children, yeah, just saying right. what they they learned. Um, and and I have reached out to the FBI uh, field office yeah, to mm -hmm. um, to finish to give us some training as well. And um, while Dr. Carson gave us some excellent training from the I've been their side. Um, we wanted to pair this up with law enforcement and, and some of the, the more acute things that they're going to talk about as, as, as it relates to ident identifying sex trafficking in your area. So I reached out to the uh, FBI field office in Baltimore, and they're willing to come out and sit with us and oh. walk us through this mm -hmm. as a commu another community event. So Excellent. Um, it, it, it doesn't stop. Whenever you want to help people, believe me, there's always room to do that so I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. uh, you know just me taking too. this to the next level and I believe that um, as we start talking more and more about it other people will come out and say hey you know we're doing something because one thing that Teresa and I we always have this conversation let's find out who else is out there doing it maybe right. somebody's watching your show today Kim and they say you know what yeah. I, we have a group and we've been working in this area. It's a mm -hmm. small group, but we've been working in this area. I, what, what number would they call to, mm -hmm. to get them to, to reach us, Therese? Because all I know is my number. Mm -hmm. What's our number? Mm -hmm. the, so, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying yeah. to think of the best way to do this, and at the risk for, of, for of volunteers. At, at the risk of flooding, at the risk right now of flooding Nikia call with calls. Call. Call. <laughs> I, think, I think if people want more information or they would like to offer something or let us know what they're doing, really the best place to call is 301-392-6600. Mm -hmm. That is actually my executive assistant, but Nakia really manages a lot of that information coming mm -hmm. into the, the agency flow. to uh -huh. make sure it gets to the right person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the best place to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can ask for information through her. Again, it, it, I think you're right. If, if you're doing something out there, if there are folks out there who are working with this population, would like us to know more, um, that would be that'd be a great way to connect with us. Mm -hmm. I'll put um, it on the spot. I'm sorry. Oh no, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was going to ask about, about the contact, yeah. and and I know you all will be back too in mm -hmm. the studio to tell us more as this goes on, and and other things that the agency is doing, and wanting to hear more about your efforts too in the in the new uh, position, mm -hmm. and and I know you're very excited about it. Uh, anything you want to add as as we uh, uh, close oh, I, this? I think today I want to just <laughs> 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 I want to make sure that that nothing's lost. I don't want to add too much. To, I got a lot I'd like to say, but yeah, I think Therese kind of brought it home with, to tell, let us know about the trauma-informed communities. We shared a little bit of the things that we've done with the, mm -hmm. um, the, 
the uh, food pantry. Um, you saw what happened with human trafficking. We want to thank uh, President Commissioner Collins for coming out to that mm -hmm. uh, event yes. that night and speaking to the people about different things, initiatives that he's uh, involved in that will help us in, in that area. There were tons of people that, I mean, we can't mention them all, the volunteers. Mm -hmm. It surprised you, didn't that. it? It surprised you the number of yeah. people. But again, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so again, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. And and when we we come back, we'll talk a little more about some of the other initiatives that we're involved mm -hmm. in. Yep. And I appreciate you thanking um, Commissioner Collins and and um, Sheriff Barry also spoke. You know, again, it was it was wonderful to see our county leaders also at this meeting and. Um, I'm looking forward to, to how we support some of their efforts going forward again as well. I, and I do, I want to reiterate one thing you said though that is not about trafficking, but it is about social services. I, I hope that this also prompts people to look for, going forward, to look for announcements um, on Facebook, on the Charles County Department of Social Services website mm -hmm. um, regarding those events in the community mm -hmm. where As you people go can out, come the and outreach. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a level of outreach we've not done before. Mm -hmm. um, and John really is in charge of all of that. And while a, a number of, of those events will be, some of those events will take place during the day, a lot of them are going to be in the evenings, they'll be on the weekends, so that we can reach the, the largest population here that we yeah. can. There are a number mm -hmm. of faith uh, leaders that work all day. Mm -hmm. Right. They're not full-time pastors or full-time community activists. So when we do something during the daytime, we're asking them to leave their job to be involved in it. So you'll see a lot of things t happening in the evening, a lot of things happening mm -hmm. on the weekend, mm -hmm. um, just so that we can t reach out and really connect with this community. I think community connectivity is going to be the, 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 the term of the day. Okay. We have to do it. I like I that. Agree. I like that. And again, mm -hmm. we look forward to you coming back to talk about that. I know that uh, you will definitely uh, do that. <laughs> Thank you. And thank again, you for having us. Yes, Therese Wolf, Director mm -hmm. of Charles County's Department of Social Services, and Pastor John Lewis. And again, I want to make sure that I have your job uh, title right: Outreach and Chaplaincy Coordinator. Correct. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, good yeah. luck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And for the folks out there, thanks for watching in the studio. Mm -hmm.